Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, um, so without further ado, we're going to start uh, the first talk. Um, and this is a team mentored by uh, Sebastian and myself, uh, consisted of Iman Ahmed, Shannon Evans, Reva Trope, and Steven Vasquez from Pace, NYC College of Technology, Yeshiva University, and Manhattan <laughs> College, respectively. And I'm just going to lead it off. Shannon Evans is, is going to start us off. So Shannon, take it away. Good evening, everyone. Tonight I'm, tonight I'm excited to tell you about the ins and outs of the New York City subway system. So first off, a few questions that we looked at when conducting this project were, how do people travel in a complex transit network? Can we classify these train stations based off their turnstile data? Can we use this data to get better estimates of lo the local population by time of day? And also, can we use a simple network flow algorithm to make sense of these data? So a few general statistics before we move on. The New York City subway system is one of the largest systems in the, in the, the world with about 468 stations for approximately 6 million trips per weekday compared to 3 million chip, trips per, week, per weekend day. And also its busiest station, Times Square, has over 277,000 trips, entry, entries and exits per day. So in, in this project, we used two data sources. One was the general trans, transit feed specification data, which provided us with the transfers between sta each station, the transfer times, and also the geographic, ge the geographical location. Also, we used the MTA turnstile data, which gave cumulative counts of the entries and exits in periods of four hour, four hour time blocks. Our time, our time frame for this project was from last October to this July. And also, due to incompatible, inc incomplete data, we excluded the PATH, Staten Island Railroad, the LIR, R, and New Jersey Transit. So in all, in our study, we, we look at 30, four, four, 434 subway stations. So a general overview of the MTA system. You, if you look at this graph, you can see that entries are roughly 30% more than exits, and it's not because people are not leaving the, sit the subway. <laughs> it's because of times like rush hour, people are more generally using the emergency exit to, to leave. So these exits go unaccounted for. And also, if you look at Mondays and Fridays, you can see that they're slightly lower than the other days. And this is because some holidays usually occur on Mondays, and people usually take Fridays off uh, or work from home. So. Moving on over to this graph, this kind of reinforces the previous graph. Where you can see entries are fluctuating around six million, so and it's it's generally stable except for ho a, few, a few holidays, where if you look at the, f the few dips, <coughs> this this dip right here accounts for Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, Memorial Day, and one also interesting fact that we found out was that. On January 27, there was this snowstorm in New York, which limited ridership on that, that day. So before we could get the data into a pretty clean format, there are a few challenges that we had to overcome. For example, there are a few crazy stuff going, going on with the turnstile data, where turnstile counts were going down. And also, some machines weren't reporting for a few days. And we had other little problems with matching our two data sets together, where there are multiple stations with the same names, but were in different geographical locations. They were a few blocks away, so we had to differentiate between those. And also, in the two data sets, there were stations with slightly different names, so we had to do a few tweaks to get them to match up. So as, as I mentioned before, entries and exits did not match up, so we needed to balance them up to be able to put into our flow algorithm. So we used an adjustment factor to scale up the exits to match. So it does all our minute analysis uses the balanced data. So now I'd kind of like to hand you over to Stephen, who's going to talk to you about the usage across the network.
Um, all right. Hey, everyone. I'm Steve. Um, so after looking at the, uh, at the data, um, one thing that really came up was how do different stations serve different transit purposes? So what we decided to do was classify each station into one of three categories. Uh, a commercial station, ideally those stations surrounded by businesses. A residential station, ideally those stations surrounded by homes. And then link stations, which is everything else. Uh, we define a, a commercial station to have the following properties. Uh, during day times, they had to have 1.3 times greater uh, uh, exits than entries, so people are uh, leaving a station, going to work, and at night, they had to have 1.3 times greater entries than exits, so people getting on the train, heading home. Uh, conversely, residential stations had to have 1.3 times greater daily entries in the morning, getting on, going about their business, uh, and at night, they had to have 1.3 times greater uh, exits, so coming home. So now we're looking at a map of each station colored by its station type. Um, each station is uh, weighted by its daily entries. Uh, you can see here that our average uh, hourly entries and exits are around 1,500 for commercial. And this significantly drops when looking at residential stations to around 400, uh, which I think intuition shows. I mean, uh, people are coming uh, not only as residential, they're limited to New York City uh, trains, but uh, commercial stations, people are coming elsewhere from New Jersey, Long Island, surrounding uh, neighborhoods. And link stations are around 500. And one notable station is Grand Central 42nd Street, which has about 188,000 daily exits. It's about 2.8 exits per second. So how I thought about this was, I mean, if you assume people are leaving the station, there's always a door somewhere that's being opened, and there's a lot of AC being wasted. <laughs> um, uh, looking further into this map, you can see that there are virtually no residential stations in Manhattan. They lie within the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens. But the majority of commercial stations are within Midtown Manhattan, the Financial District, Downtown Manhattan. With the exception of a few, like up here, I noticed, I looked at this, and it's uh, Columbia University, that's that stop. So they follow commercial patterns. Um, over here is Long Island City. And I know personally, I go over there for car dealerships. Um, and down here, by Bay Ridge, there's a few places. There's a military base. Um, uh, a cemetery and right around the park is, I mean, right around the corner of Sunset Park. Uh, so now we're looking at maps of a commercial uh, station and a residential station. The commercial being Fulton Street, which follows the patterns of uh, high exits in the morning, there's a big spike, and at night there are a bunch of entries going, so people leaving, going home. Uh, and here for residential stations, there's a big spike in the morning, people getting on the train to go to work and then exiting, coming home from work. And also notice that there are, the scales differ dramatically, being that commercial stations receive more traffic than residential stations. So we looked at these types and what we really wanted to see was uh, how do these compare to one another. So what we did was look at the net exits, which we defined as the hourly exits minus the hourly entries later known as the demand, which I'm, I, Amon is going to speak about. You can see again, commercial stations are considerably larger than residential stations uh, in, the, in the morning. And then it drops in the evening. And link stations, they don't really show anything too significant. They sort of flutter around zero, meaning that entries and exits are fairly similar. Um, and now I want to pass it on to Amon to discuss flow. Hello. Okay. Um, hi. So I'm going to be talking about the flow on the subway transit network. Um, so before we went ahead and computed the flow, we actually had to construct a graph. And what we did was we made a directed graph 
uh, using an adjacency matrix from our merge data set that looked something like this. So for each train station, we had all the stops at the station uh, that the train went to, um, all the actual station names that that train stop was uh, linked to, the travel time it takes to get from one station to another in seconds, um, and the geopositions as well as the entries and exits that we got from the turnstile data. Um, so once we had this uh, merged data set, we went ahead and made an adjacency matrix and then defined our graph as uh, with nodes and edges. And what we did was we defined nodes, we defined our nodes as train stations where all lines are accessible with a free transfer. And we made our edges, the rail links between each adjacent station. So for example, this would be a node, Van Cortlandt Park would be a node, and then there'd be an edge from Van Cortlandt Park to 238th Street. Um, and then for every single edge, we had a cost, which we defined as the time it takes to travel from one station to another. And as we can see, like the one train is pretty local. So this is like a minute and 30 seconds to get from one station to another in this. Um, and then once we had our adjacency matrix defined and our graph defined, we went ahead and created this, which is very hard to interpret and um, which is, yeah, it's very hard to interpret without the geographical locations, which we add later on. But one thing that we can tell from this uh, network is that um, stations that are like very condensed, like uh, very popular, polluted, like Times Square, probably most likely within here, whereas stations where Lion Star are most likely out here. Um, and then so we get a better view of this once we add the geopositions. And we can see you know, there are a lot of stations in Manhattan, a uh, little less in Brooklyn, sort of the same thing in Queens and Bronx. Um, and once we had this graph, we went ahead and computed the degree for every single uh, node. And what we got was that the average station has two neighbors. So that means like from one station, you can get to like or at average two other stations. Um, and so a cool fact we found was that at 14th Street Union Square, there were 10 neighboring uh, adjacent stations, whereas Times Square, which is you know the most trafficked, has only seven. Well, not only, but you know. Um, and then we get an even better view, kind of like the MTA, uh, once we add in the train lines. And uh, we're not counting stand line. That's why it's like I kind of covered it, but yeah. Um, and then afterwards, once we had our uh, graphs, our directed graph defined, we went ahead and added a, a demand to every single node. So for every station, we added demand, which we defined as net exits, meaning the amount of people that are leaving a station, uh, amount of people that are leaving one station and then entering in a station per hour. Um, and then from this, we were able to take uh, using um, Network X, which is a module on Python, we were able to compute the minimum cost flow uh, to satisfy the demand at every station by minimizing the cost, which we define as the time traveled on the network. Um, so we were able to take like data that we observed, such as the exits and entries at every single station, and we were able to infer um, ob unobservable quantities, such as the inflow and outflow of every station uh, using that. Um, and we, we did minimum cost flow, although there were other flows, because usually when people are using the MTA, they're trying to get to their destination as fast as possible. Um, Okay, and then once we had this, we had sort of the inflow and outflow of every single station, which tells us, you know, how many people are coming into every single station from other stations and how many people are going to other stations from that one station. Um, and then, so from that, we were able to define flow direction, and we were thinking about what to make our central point, and we decided on Grand Central, since it's in Midtown and most people work in Midtown. So we said that, um, for example, if a person is, if the person, if a person is traveling and they're going to a station that's closer to Grand Central, then they're going inbound towards Midtown, and if a person is going towards a station that is further from Grand Central, they're going outbound, away from Midtown. Um, and once we had these definitions cleared up, we went ahead and constructed this graph. Um, <laughs> Which um, this is for like the morning time. So in this graph, we can see that you know as people are traveling from like Brooklyn towards Midtown Manhattan, the these uh, tadpoles are getting larger, and that sort of means that the flow at every single station is getting larger, and more people are like getting on the trains, and all of the flow, as you can see, is like blue. So that means almost everybody is going inbound, except for like some people in Manhattan that are going you know downtown to Midtown and Midtown to downtown. Um, so this is for the morning time. And then once we do evening, we get uh, pretty pred predictable results. Um, you know, Everybody who went to work is going back now, and the node sizes are larger here and then going smaller here. Um, and everyone's traveling this way, uh, as well as you know going outbound, whereas before they were going inbound. Um, and now I'm going to pass it on to Reva, who's going to discuss the local populations and future directions. So where can we go with this? 
Well, one thing that we've started to do was to add this information that we have about the flow of stations throughout, of people throughout New York to the census data that we already have, because the way we currently define a population is the amount of people living in a city. But New York, as we most of us know, is not really filled with the people living there. Most of the people there um, actually don't live there. So um, using, this is the original census data, which is just residential populations. And as you can see, the regions look pretty uniform throughout. Midtown, Midtown is actually lower than the rest of the regions. Um, and I don't think that that is true to our observations. But the city, we usually see like high fluctuations based on where we are. Um, but if you add our net exits to the census data, we see that first Midtown goes from being 10 to 30,000 people to over a million, um, which is a tenfold increase and I think is truer to what we see. Um, also, other southern regions of Manhattan go get very high, while residential districts kind of clear out. This is at noon. Um, we can also look at the data at afternoon versus late night. At 4 p.m., there are far more people in Manhattan as a whole, um, and especially you'll see in the parks like Rikers Island and Central Park um, than in four, that at 4 a.m. And during the, in the residential stations, um, people have cleared out in the afternoon and come back home at night. Um, this is a, an animation of how the subway changes, the population changes if you account for subway data. And you can see the regions growing lighter and darker. This is the late night, no one's in the parks, early morning. Now Midtown's starting to clear, like fill in around noon, and it's getting ever more populated until people get home in the evening and night again. So one potential application of this is for a lot of studies that use a population rate, they, the bottom number is the number of people. But for a study like this, which calculates the number of innocent people stopped a year over the number of people in the area, there are some regions, like over here, that it's like drastic. But over here, in Midtown, it looks drastic, but probably isn't. They're not getting a lot of complaints. Um, so if you account for the subway data, the denominator is going to be almost 10 times larger. And the number is probably going to look very similar to the ones around it. Um, so something like this could be incorporated into a lot of different studies and things like epidemiology, where you could study how the disease flows throughout the uh, stations. Um, also, um, just knowing where you could expend um, money on public resources, you could know where to put things. Just knowing where people are is a big um, deal in your studies. All right. Thanks. <laughs>
you all know the answer. Uh, so the question is, I'll repeat it for the camera. Uh, was the adjustment factor constant across the network you know, by time of day, or was it uh, station specific? Yeah, sure. Uh, it was accounted for for each time period that we had. So for, uh, for each, so a time period was uh, an increments of four hour periods. So for each four hour block, it was accounted for. But it was uh, uniform across the network. Uh, yeah, Jaxi. So uh, I, um, I know of, uh, of a, a city bike and how if this just exhibits similar patterns where you have the residential right and then flow in the morning to the commercial and now flow in the later. So I want to, and, and that shows some problems with like, you know, the availability of bikes and stuff like that. So I want to know like what, what problems come up um, of that you know of that relate to this flow problem? Like are there like maybe more and more uh, issues with the turnstiles and stuff like that, more errors in more traffic stations and stuff like that? Are you familiar with any of those sure. occurrences? Do you want to answer that? That's not that's not something we really looked into, but it's something something we should definitely look into. Thanks. Yeah. If you want to do a part two, New York just released taxi data, which I think would complement this pretty well. Yep. <laughs> Sid. Um, has anything you learned during the product changed the way you use the subway? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're first. Well, I definitely don't use the exit doors anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, I think we have time for one more question. <laughs> going once, going twice. All right, let's give one more round of uh, Christian. Oh, I got, got it. What do you got, Christian? So if you wanted ground truth, couldn't you do that? I mean, I don't know whether you will have the data, but the fire department probably knows that you can have maximally 75 people on this floor and so on. So you might get from fire department data sort of capacity in quotation marks of area, so you could see whether you would at least fit your 500,000 mm. people or not. So we can look into if they produce that data. Could be. I don't know if the fire, like, I don't know if Midtown is fire safe, like, you know. If you <laughs> 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 okay, perfect. All right, let's, let's thank him with that. <laughs> <laughs>